Our Brigadier General Fredenberg, Vice President, ABSEA International, Ms. Linda Newton, Hawaii Chapter President, Admiral Mackey, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. It's a pleasure to be here during TechNet Asia Pacific um, as one of your coalition partners and as a panel moderator. Assembled here today is an outstanding panel of coalition leaders, and I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce each. Uh, firstly, uh, Brigadier Alan Lister, US Indo-PACOM J5 Deputy Director for Policy. Uh, Brigadier Litzer trained initially as a Commando Infantry Officer. In 2013, he changed specialization into the UK Defence Engagement Career Stream. Operational highlights have included tours to Northern Ireland, the Balkans, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Key staff and command appointments have included Chief of Staff to Headquarters 3 Commando Brigade, and Alpha and Command of Alpha Company 40 Commando Royal Marines and Commando Fleet Protection Group Royal Marines. Uh, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, Rear Admiral Brett Sunta, Royal Australian Navy, is currently the Deputy Director uh, for Maritime Operations Commander U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, Rear Admiral Sunta's uh, career as a surface warfare officer has uh, saw him complete a range of sea postings as Executive Officer in Her Majesty Australia ships, Newcastle, Stewart and Darwin, and as commanding officer of HMA ships Ballarat, Stewart and Anzac. He also commanded the Amphibious Task Group and Joint Task Force 635. Our key staff roles have included Director of Maritime Operations, Headquarters Joint Operations Command, our Deputy Commodore of Warfare in Fleet Headquarters, and Direc Director General Military Strategy in our Policy Division, and most recently, Chief of Staff to Headquarters Joint Operations Command. Uh, gentlemen, thank you uh, for joining us today uh, to discuss a topic that I consider extremely important, uh, which is information sharing challenges with achieving interoperability. Achieving interoperability is key to ensuring that as a coalition force, we're able to realize our full potential in terms of the combined effects that can be delivered at all levels. Across all allies and partners, we actually have similar information sharing challenges while there have been some great advancements, advancements that have improved our information sharing ability and consequently our overall effectiveness as a coalition, I believe there's still more, more work to be done, uh, particularly to address those complicated challenges uh, that we all experience. Further, the pace and scale of technological change means that more than ever, we need to be closely aligned in order to bridge those information sharing gaps, which span a range of considerations which go well beyond just those technological ones uh, that we are all familiar with. Uh, both our current and also our past experiences will be important toward informing how we look to address information sharing challenges uh, yet to be fully resolved. Discussions such as this will be critically important in terms of informing how industry might assist efforts aimed at addressing those information sharing challenges. Uh, before I uh, pass over to the uh, panel to provide their opening comments, um, I would like to ask that any questions um, uh, relating to the national position of the Australia and US uh, UK uh, defence actually be avoided, uh, particularly given that uh, both of our panel members are currently embedded members within the US uh, government. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Brigadier Lister. Brigadier Lister, can you provide your perspective on the information sharing challenges currently impacting interoperability from your perspective? Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to um, echo the thanks to um, AFSIA and uh, the distinguished uh, organisation which has invited us here today. Um, so my, my job, I'm the Head of Policy uh, for Deputy Director for J5, but Head of Policy for Indo-PACOM, uh, but I also deal with security cooperation, which is a large uh, part of the portfolio. So. In terms of information sharing and data, I deal with these issues a lot, probably about two to three times a week they come to my attention. And I also keep a very close eye on bilateral information sharing agreements, such as Jasomias, for example, which we have with many nations um, in the region. So I'm looking forward to a wide range of questions. I've seen uh, the first spread of questions, which I've got some prepared answers to which I'm looking forward to teasing out some of the issues there. I have to stress though, I'm not a comms or a data expert by any means. I'm a British Marine and like US Marines, I struggle to spell VHF. <laughs> See what I did there? Uh, but what I can do is comment on the process and some of the obstacles, some of the hurdles and some of the workarounds that we use in that. 
You'll also note I'm sharing um, a panel with two Australians, so I'd like to ban any mention of cricket for the next <laughs> hour or so. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, uh, what can I do following a fellow UK officer? But uh, as he points out, there's two Australians up here and one POM, as we call them in Australia, so what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> You know, as a two-star admiral uh, and the Brigadier General being a one-star, I would say to you, let's talk about cricket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as long as we don't talk about rugby. Yeah. And then if you talk about baseball and NFL, we'll all just look with blank stares and just nod and say, that's a great outcome. Hey, look, thanks very much for the invite. Um, and in all honesty, I, I think the panel does represent where your country has come in leaps and bounds with information sharing. I am the Deputy Director of Maritime Operations in US Pacific Fleet. I am one of seven flag officers in that headquarters working from Admiral Paparo, who you had the opportunity to, to listen to on Monday. Um, and if I was to say outwardly, and it's not just because he's my boss, uh, he is one that understands this challenge and is at the forefront of this challenge. So noting the classification we're talking about here, I just say to you that the stuff that I get to look at now, I would not have believed that I would have that opportunity only mere years ago. Um, so I think, you know, we can talk about the technical aspect of uh, sharing information. And like Alan, I'm a surface warfare officer, so I, I'm not even sure what he spelt when he said VHF. But what I do know is the fact that it's really about trust, and it's really about entrusting those uh, partners that we have. Like Catherine Allen said, um, as an embedded officer, I'll make comment about US Pacific Fleet stuff, I'll make comment about my own opinions, and I'll caveat it by that, but I probably won't talk much about Australia's position, uh, because I'm effectively a US officer with a funny accent. Some may say that I come from Boston, but I actually don't. Um, and apologies to anyone that comes from Massachusetts, but you are the people that I understand the most. It's probably our Irish backgrounds. Um, look, I just wanted to make a few opening comments before I hand over. Um, and I just say to you this, our collective strength in the challenges that we have now and in the future is allies and partners. We can talk about technology, we can talk about other things, and definitely, you know, this is a technological sort of focused forum, and we should talk about it when you want. But the US's key strategic strength in the growing challenges that we see in the geostrategic environment is allies and partners. Why do I say that? Because Others do not have the same strengths that you have. And you only got to look at the national defence strategy over many years, and more recently, the most recent one, which is about to hit the streets, and I've only just seen the unclassified fact sheet, which you can all get, but it talks about, again, the importance of allies and partners, and I would argue it takes it another step forward when it makes commentary about integrated deterrence, and for a long while, integrated deterrence was about whole of government, US government, industry getting together. If you look at the latest definition of integrated deterrence, rightly, it includes allies and partners. And the second comment I would make in the most recent national defense strategy is the fact that it talks about the incorporation of allies and partners' perspectives at every stage, and I underline that, at every stage of planning. So we've, we're taking it to the next step, and I think we have to as we move on. And as we find in the technology space, we have to invest in allies and partners, not only just financially, but in the everyday business that we do. And I would say to you, as a studier of strategic policy, and you've heard the fact that I worked in strategic policy in Australia, so I study strategic policy quite often. We are taking those steps, and the US, importantly, has invested in allies and partners over many years. And you, we, as a US embed, are now reaping that benefit. 
And there's some examples which we can talk about in the Q&A that demonstrates why that's important when you come up against people or organisations or nations that do not do the right thing. And so if I was a teacher marking a report card, and believe it or not, I come from a family of teachers, so I am definitely the black sheep of that family, I would say to you that we're about a five out of 10. We've done a lot that we need to do, but we need to do more. And what I think it just generally comes down to is risk. How much risk are you willing to take now? How much trust are you going to put in your partners now? Because we're currently in this theatre in competition and I would say to you that we are therefore closest to, closer to crisis than we are to cooperation. So the trust and the interoperability that we've learned through unfortunate decades in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, we need to transfer into this theatre now so that we are ready, should, and I hope it does not occur, we get to crisis in this theatre moving forward. The geostrategic environment has a common thread now, and that is the paucity of time. We no longer have the benefit of time to actually uh, do strategic challenges all the way through to operational challenges. So the question I will leave you on, and I'll close my remarks with that is if you take my theory that we no longer have the benefit of time and you perceive that there is a risk to the US strategic environment, do you follow the policies and principles that you've got now or do you take risk with them and invest in them now on the supposition that you may, with that trust, lose some of that information that you are protecting. So there's a fine balance there between, I think, risk and trust. Thanks very much. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for those opening comments. Uh, now I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Um, but to get things started, I've actually got a few that um, I'll start with. Uh, so please uh, use the email that you see on the screen up the front and uh, please do push through those questions. Uh, so the first question I wanted to put out there um, relates to the importance of allies and partners. Uh, so what is your perspective on the importance of allies and partners? Uh, Brigadier Lister. Uh, thank you. And I'd really just like to echo the Admiral's points, um, which really resonate through pretty much everything that the command does. Um, I would say just about every high-level engagement that our leadership has, um, Admiral Aquilino mm. and his deputy, Lieutenant General Sklenka, uh, allies and partners is not a trite phrase. I think the realization has finally hit home that this is a very powerful combination that needs investment. Um, and basically, allies and partners is my bread and butter. So um, as the policy lead for the headquarters, I'm responsible for the teams who look after all four regions um, in the Indo-Pacific AOR, as well as security cooperation, which is that golden thread of equipment and capability and enabling activity that links the policy teams together. And whilst I acknowledge the importance of allies and partnerships, uh, we also need to recognize the limits of what we can do together at the moment. And that goes back to the Admiral's five out of 10 score on the report card. As Winston Churchill said during the Second World War, there's only one thing worse than fighting with allies and that's fighting without them. So we, within the J5 shop, have regular and detailed discussions about the differences between interchangeability and interoperability, just as one example. Those terms are similar, subtly different, and not really well understood. Interchangeability for us, for example, means an ally and partner can be somewhere else, which means the US, in turn, can be somewhere else, safe in the knowledge that business is being taken care of by a capable, close ally or partner. <clears throat> Interoperability is obviously much harder to achieve, but it's not impossible, as we've seen in the theatre recently with the UK's carrier deployment last year to this region with USMC F-35 jets embarked alongside UK aircraft. And just to let you know what an effort of will that was, 
I was the UK attache to the US Marine Corps uh, from 2012 until 2015. And my daily chore was making that deployment, uh, first of all, getting the US to sign up to it, and then trying to realize the deployment in terms of operationalizing it. Luckily, the Queen Elizabeth carrier was still in build in Rosyth at the, mo at the time, and we took General Neller when he was Commandant of the Marine Corps to the shipyard, and literally we were standing in the bones of the ship as it was being built, and we took a whole bunch of planners from the aviation team in headquarters Marine Corps, and we said, here's your space. This is the US space on our aircraft carrier. What do you need? And that's where the TS wires were all being plumbed in exactly as the US team wanted them to be. It is an eye-wateringly expensive proposition to do, but once you do it, you see the investment pay off. And not just the fact that two nations were operating from a single carrier, the fact that we had the four carriers operating together in the region at the same time sends a really, really powerful message. And really, to finally echo uh, what the Admiral said, the, valley, uh, the value of allies and partners, it actually transcends even interoperability, in my opinion. If you've got nations who are willing and demonstrably willing to work together for common goals in a framework of an understood and an accepted version of the international norms, is a hugely powerful combination, and it's something that our peer competitor does not enjoy in the region. Hey, thanks. Um, I've had a couple of comments about allies and partners, but I'll just probably expand on those. Um, and I'll just say for up front, if you, and I sort of mentioned this in my speech, but if you want to see a clear everyday picture of why allies and partners are so important, just turn on the TV right now and see what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, I could probably end it there, but... Um, it really does pay, therefore, to uh, invest in those as well. And, and Alan brought up a really good point. It's not to say that allies and partners will be equal. Obviously, depending upon what the, the requirement is, depending upon what a partner's national sovereignty uh, and interests are, that will wax and wane. But if you look at the interoperability versus interchangeability uh, definition, which we are starting to use a bit more, to me, you want to basically achieve interoperability with nearly every ally and partner that you can get at a different sort of scale and scope. But with your true partners and those that have the trust and willingness, if I introduce those two terms, you want interchangeability. Because we have garnered and probably known for a long time that the world is so complex now that we can't possibly be, be everywhere at every time. So we really are going to have to trust our allies and partners to do things that we probably thought in the US uh, probably 10 years ago plus that we would do ourselves. Um, so, so that's where you need to go. Um, if I can just talk about trust and willingness for a moment. Um, you know, in preparation for this uh, panel, I was just doing some research and I came across a, a really good simplistic uh, I think, definition of trust, which I just want to sort of bring out and, and just touch on a couple of points. And I just want to read this out. It says, trust is the extent to which one party is willing to depend on somebody or something in a given situation with a feeling of relative security, even though negative consequences are possible. And there's some implicit and explicit terminology in there. I like it because it's simple. But I would say to you, just to pull a couple of points out, which I think are important as we move forward, relative security, even though negative consequences are possible. I think sometimes we are a bit risk adverse in the way that we treat the sharing of information and the like. And I think we just need to become more risk aware, noting the fact that, as I say, as we trust more, and my argument is we need to trust more now, that there will be some negative consequences as, a con as, as part of that. That's the way it is. And we just need to learn and adopt as we move forward. Definitely, you know, when you look at the NDS definition that I talked about at the outset, where we have to trust allies and partners at every stage and level. 
To me, that is suggesting that we are morphing from the interoperability and we are getting in certain elements to the interchangeability moving forward. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Um, now moving on to um, something that I think helps us all in terms of understanding how we can um, address some of the gaps that we, uh, we see. It's our shared experiences. Uh, certainly from my perspective, uh, having uh, worked um, at sea a lot and also having uh, recently come from CENTCOM, I can see that our past experiences can help us in informing how we might move forward in terms of uh, addressing some of those information sharing gaps. Uh, so gentlemen, uh, based on your experiences, how has information sharing improved and what enhancements can be introduced to further optimise our information sharing ability? Uh, Brigadier Litster. Uh, thank you. Um, so my past experience in this area starts in 2003, and I'm sure I share that piece of desert with many people in the room in Kuwait uh, in advance of the land invasion of Iraq in March of that year. Um, a unique set of circumstances in terms of uh, planning and C2, and what the word you're gonna hear all the way through my initial experiences is the word pragmatic, and that was the approach that was adopted from the get-go. Um, I just finished US Marine Corps uh, Command and Staff College, which is why I still write in crayon, and <laughs> As a result of that, I was uh, posted to the liaison team, detached from my parent Marine Brigade, to fight under command of the MEF. To do so with um, a fast-moving beast like that, just one, one example, we were going to need better access to TACSAT channels and the hardware. That demand signal was only hugely increased once Turkey refused to let UK and US forces invade northern Iraq and our brigade, which was attached to the MEF, was expanded to a full armoured division just before we stepped over the line of departure. And at no stage was information sharing a problem during those initial planning days in Q8. In fact, we actually had a classification known as marine form for good reason, where we were seeing exactly what we needed to see in terms of information and intelligence, and the hardware was being shared at the very lowest level and trust, you trust people until it really starts to feel painful and then you push a bit further and that's my experience. So really, I think I would sum up that to say necessity often drives a really pragmatic approach in this area. Thanks, Alan. Um, well, my experience started in 1993 when I first went to sea, and believe it or not, we were in Southeast Asia then. Uh, we've probably just rinsed and repeated, and, uh, and that a whole bunch of that time was sailing with US task forces. Um, look, I think we've come a long way, a, a remarkable way, and when I look back at my 32 years of experience, if I thought that I would be an embedded officer, as I said at the outset, in the US Pacific Fleet Command, I don't think only two years ago you would think that would occur. So we've, we've come a, an awful long way. And I think sometimes, like good Western societies, we're pretty good at beating ourselves up. Um, and we should really probably look at the positives and, and how remarkable we've been in a short period of time to get you know this Bostonian-like speaking Australian into a US-dominated headquarters. Um, and the other thing I'd say as well is that, and this is the Australian experience I will share with you, is um, you're not alone. I mean, my country itself is not the best as well. Um, the technical aspect of it, I, I think we need to solve quick, and we've been looking at it for 10 plus years, and I think we're slowly getting there. I can see a concerted effort to get there, so that's good. It really just now, I think, more and more comes down to the more policy and the sharing parameters that we have around that, which we probably need to relook at and just ask the question, you know, policy is in place for good reason, don't get me wrong, but we should ask the question, is the policy contemporary uh, and future-proof? And I think in some ways it is, and in some ways it's not. Um, and. And look, the other thing I would say to you as an Australian is, um, who would have ever thought only a year and a half ago, maybe a year ago, that we have this thing called AUKUS? And, you know, we'd be sharing quite sensitive technology information to a bunch of Australians down in the great southern land. I, I think only a year or two ago, you wouldn't have thought that. I, I think 
really good progress. What I'd like to see is those things like AUKUS leveraged more into the information space. And it was very pleasing to see the recent announcement about AUKUS and that there is now a recognised information sharing element under the uh, technological aspect of AUKUS. I just wonder whether over time, hopefully not too long a time, we can expand that to be a more broadened sort of information focus sharing moving forward. Uh, sir, thank you. Um, you've touched on the, um, the policy considerations, but uh, what factors um, outside those technical uh, considerations should be considered as we look how best to improve our information sharing as a coalition? Brigitte Litzer. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to state the obvious. Uh, there's no NATO um, in this region, and uh, that's actually worth noting right from the get-go. There's no sharing agreements on, at a multilateral level. There's no relevant STANAGs uh, to fall back on. And the security structures and the fora, there's many of them in this region, aren't operationalized to that kind of level at all. And that's probably the first and most important point. So much of what we do is done on a bilateral basis in terms of information sharing agreements between the US and regional allies and partners. But it doesn't mean you can't share information successfully and probably the best example I can give you is the US Maritime Security Initiative, or MSI. And that's how we level the playing field, in my opinion, in terms of sharing maritime domain awareness information. And the key tool at our disposal is called Sea Vision. Some of you will probably know about this. The US government and its Department of Transport and US Navy developed, funded, and maintained unclassified maritime uh, domain awareness service which is resident on the open web. Our MSI program, which our friends in PAC Fleet administer on our behalf, it funds access to Sea Vision currently for all of our Southeast Asian and South Asian partners, and it's soon to be rolled out wider into Oceania. It allows those nations enrolled to see the same picture and then communicate and share information with each other. And there's three really key elements to the program. The first is sense, and the second is share, which obviously the Sea Vision system allows the partners to do. And then the final stage is contribute, which is how those partners react and respond to what they can see. So the US has got a role all the way through from providing access to the technology, allowing those nations to share the information with each other, and then also at the back end, if you like, or at the contribute end, through foreign military sales of aircraft, patrol craft, and other capabilities to be able to contribute to some kind of a finish, be that legally or be that within their own EEZ. And I, I can give you another great example that um, our colleagues in Indonesia, for example, are using Sea Vision today and they're tracking sanction busting um, Russian tankers moving through the region using a US provided system. So if you want to see a reflection from current activity in Ukraine and Europe being reflected here, that's just how useful that system is. No, I spoke about policy before. I think we just need to look at it from a US perspective and say, is it contemporary now and for the future? And as I said, in some areas I think it is, in some areas it's not. You have a beautiful thing here called foreign disclosure. Uh, I think that's got a place. Um, I think a lot of people I hear say, let's get rid of foreign disclosure. Well, that's a sovereignty thing. Um, so I think we probably just need to look at it and sort of say, is it contemporary for the future challenges? And as Alan was saying, uh, rather than just sort of saying we can't share information, getting to that point where, well, how can we share information? And as Alan suggested, we're already sharing a lot of information with allies and partners. We just sanitise it and we make sure that um, we're applicable, that uh, the sources and the like are protected. Um, there is a question I, I get back to about, uh, and this is where, you know, it happens in Australia as well, where people believe that policy is like law. It's not. Um, and, and so, you know, where we think it's not fit for purpose, go through the process of changing it. Um, I know that's a long and slavish process in your country, just like it is in mine, but that is a true benefit of bureaucracy. Uh, because it does the checks and balances that we have in bureaucracy and it allows others to have a say 
rather than just one person having a say. But I think we just need to look at that and just make sure that it is future and contemporary proof moving forward. Uh, I think we have a few questions that have come in from the audience, uh, so we'll just uh, have those brought up. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, do you foresee a NATO-like structure in the Indo-PACOM? Look, I'll start off the batting, if I use a cricket analogy. It's also applicable to baseball, I hear, as well. Um, no, I, I don't see NATO in Indo-PACOM. We've tried it. It was called Seato. It lasted for a couple of years and then just diminished. Uh, there is a lot of, um, as Alan said, forums in Southeast Asia and, and around. And, and I think people get impatient with them. Um, but the beauty about them is actually when you work them effectively, they work. Um, I, I read a lot of readings about the frustrations of the consensus element of ASEAN. But if you actually look at what ASEAN has achieved, it's achieved quite a significant amount. Um, I think we just need to get to the stage where we um, make sure that the arrangements we have in place are applicable for now and in the future. Um, we work those arrangements that we currently have in place. But no, I, I can't see a NATO in Indo-PACOM and I would tend to argue that it wouldn't be maybe a great sort of benefit anyway. And I completely agree with what the Admiral said. Um, you know, ASEAN's structure and its ethos doesn't um, meet uh, the NATO, uh, the, well, the way that NATO was founded and the way that NATO operates. And I can see another jeopardy potentially with um, the claimants, the various claimants and the various seas um, in the region as well, not being conducive to having uh, an Article 5 type arrangement um, here in the Indo-Pacific. So, yeah, we have ASEAN. Um, ASEAN provides a framework. Um, uh, I represent Admiral Aquilino at a few of the maritime security working groups and ASEAN talks to everybody. There's Russian and Chinese participation in those working groups, the Seas Global Commons, and you see that reflected all the way through the ASEAN Charter and the way that they operate. It's just, it's just a different part of the world. Excellent. We'll move to the next question. How does the combined force dynamically balance trust and risk as the force moves from planning to execution, from the strategic to the operational, and then to the tactical level? And further, is there anything we can collectively do to increase trust and reduce risk at the data level? That's a great question, whoever came up with that. I'm just, I'm gonna to have to take a minute or two just to read it and understand it. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think um, on the first question, definitely we've probably seen the best uh, elements of trust and risk appreciation at the tactical level, um, in, in my experience. And that's because, you know, at the tactical level, you're taking a lot of that risk and you need to, I always say, when you're in a headquarters, you need to plan and execute knowing that you're actually not taking the risk. The people that are taking the core risk are on the ground. I think where we probably need to get better, in my opinion, is maybe just appreciation of that trust and risk at the strategic level and the operational level. And as I said, I, I can see vectors that are indicating to me that that is definitely taking place as we move forward. Um, do increase trust and reduce risk at the data level? Um, yeah, we possibly can. The challenge with data is the source and how we protect that source uh, moving forward. So I think that's gonna be a challenge as we move forward, but once again, we're already where I can see transferring data uh, at a risk appreciation between allies and partners as we speak. Yeah, I'd, I'd add, I mean, risk at the end of the day is a command responsibility. That's why commanders get paid a lot of money. Um, but I'm not sure the word's helpful. Um, the, career-preserving answer is to take no risk at all, and then we're back to the issues of over-classification because it's easy and it's natural.
But if you follow sensible processes, sensible procedures, that helps you reduce risk and it helps mitigate um, any future problems. And I think the best current example we've got is what's going in, on in Ukraine today. In the run-up to the invasion, the US unilaterally shared a lot of highly classified material with a wide range of allies and partners, especially Europeans, and they did so to build consensus and trust. So somebody had to take a risk decision somewhere in DC to share that information, and it appears to have paid off with NATO probably now looking stronger and more relevant than it has certainly since, I would offer, since the early 1990s. And there's been an element of risk which has been taken on, but it's led to a solid and unified uh, response. And I would judge that the person who took that risk would judge it was a risk worth taking. Uh, data versus situational awareness. Uh, what are your thoughts on accepting broader risks, sharing data in the hopes that partners can collaborate to distill that data into high value, secure situational awareness? Yeah, look, that's a great question as well, probably follows on from the last one. I think we're going to have to share more and more, and the reason I would say that is because there is so much data that's coming in now that the real challenge is you're trying to find a needle in a needle haystack, I heard someone say it before. So people talk about AI and all that kind of stuff that is going to help, and it definitely will in terms of filtering through that uh, amount of data that we are now seeing modern technological sort of platforms providing. So if you take that challenge and you say, uh, if I don't share, I would argue that your, your mound of needle haystack is probably higher. If you're able to share, you might get a better uh, opportunity uh, for that key piece of information that you're looking to come through, be detected, and shared between uh, those allies and partners as we move forward. Uh, so I think it's probably the fact that we're staring down the barrel that we are going to have to share more in the data space just so we can start to identify that, that real key element that maybe we are at risk uh, of missing. And you would have heard for those people that we're here on Monday, my boss, Admiral Paparo, talk about decision superiority. Um, and it is one of our critical advantages that we need to drive towards. Well, with decision superiority, you need to understand and have that key piece of information so that you are making those key decisions before your adversary. So sharing that data, to me, I think it makes sense and I think in certain occasions will be necessary. And uh, I note that uh, Brigadier General Wyatt Brown's in the audience, so I'll um, ab absolutely not take any of her um, thunder away from this point, but an awful lot of it will also depend on the platforms that you have available to be able to share that data. And I would just double down on what the Admiral said, that distributed operations are what we're going to be doing in the future to re reduce risk, to reduce conglomerated attractive targets in the future. And we're going to have to be able to share that pinpoint information. We're going to have to be able to do it securely. And we're going to need the systems to do it with the people that we trust to use the information. I think it's going to be that simple. Moving on to the next question. Understanding that policy is often the greatest hurdle to coalition interoperability, what technical hurdles do you see as impeding interoperability? I'm going to leave, let you lead that one off. Okay, um, thank you. You've just now introduced my favorite bugbear. Um, I think a lot of it's structural challenges um, in terms of releasability, storage, security protocols, but they're all well known and everybody in this room knows them. But I think the biggest challenge is a human cultural challenge and I think that's internal culture. And it's a really simple example. When you classify your first email of the day and you press the drop down menu on the selection bar, the first thing that comes up is, no form. And it's set up that way for a good reason. I get it. I understand it. So you're asking people to do two or three more clicks until you get to a 5i releaseability. Sometimes it's just that simple. And I've actually had, I will share with you, a piece of work that I did two months ago, which I sent off to OSD policy, who sent it back to the command marked secret. No form. The irony was not lost on me. <laughs> 
Uh, one thing I'd say is, uh, in terms of technical hurdles, is, as I said in my opening comment, I, I can see, if we just look at the technical aspect, we are striving to get technical systems out to our allies and partners that will connect us all up. And, and that's been an ongoing issue for the last 10 plus years, and it'll continue to be there. I think technically, however, we are a long way advanced than what we have been since I've seen for a long time. But let me just pose this question. Uh, if we look at risk and trust, um, why are we rolling out a separate system? Why don't we just let our allies and partners get onto our own classified systems? Just to I'll put it out there. Um, you know, uh, I have to work on a system that is not that um, but why don't we just allow that? Now, there's policy that prevents that. Um, but I get back to the commentary about the interface of policy and, and technical. If we were to roll out something that is known and we understand and arguably we have it working better than other systems, wouldn't that be the more logical way to move forward? Instead of having technical systems that go through gateway after gateway after gateway? Just to, I'll put it out there, I won't give you an answer, but you can probably guess where I'm going. <clears throat> Actually, before we move on to the next question, there was a really uh, great reflection that came from the breakfast uh, this morning. Um, I had the opportunity to have a discussion with one of the um, industry representatives and he made something, uh, he made a, a comment that I think reflects on the policy challenges that we have in, in that sometimes the policy is actually driving the technological solutions which is hindering our ability to get to where we need to be in order to get to the level of information sharing that we aspire. So I thought that that's a great point in that we've got a lot of work to do, um, both as coalition partners, in order to drive our policy changes, in order to align with where the technology is going. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Um, who is taking the lead on addressing policy issues that inhibit a joint MDO uh, data centricity, especially policies that cross COCOMs and AO boundaries? Look, I can't really put my hand and say it's Jimmy Smith who lives in the Pentagon. He's at this level. Uh, and I don't think that's what you're asking. But let me just put it there. You have two commanders in this AO, my immediate boss being Admiral Paparo and our collective immediate boss being Admiral Aquilino, who you'll have the pleasure of hearing today here, who I think are really driving this requirement. Um, and making it uh, the awareness of this requirement from a policy uh, space leading forward. Um, and, and I think, you know, we have all the right people in the right places. Um, sometimes I would say that unless you get out here and you see those challenges on an everyday basis, it's sometimes hard to understand. And I'm not throwing spears at any one particular organisation or place, I think it's reflective of anywhere that you go, you know. Um, but until you come out here and you see what's happening in this AO on an everyday basis, both in terms of uh, what is happening from other nations and what we are doing as a consequence of that, I, I really don't think you fully grasp the, the complexity of the situation. And, and that's a general comment that would be applicable to anything, right? You know, you've got an issue at your place, you know, where your kids go to school. Until you go down there and you actually see what the issue is, you really don't know. So I just think, you know, you've got a couple of commanders here which are really pushing hard on this, which is great. Um, and we just need to get more and more people, I think, an appreciation of what's going on here at the moment. Uh, yes, it comes back to what I said before about wh where I see the push. Uh, I don't see somebody who does a policy job doing the push. I see commanders um, in the Indo-PACOM headquarters doing that push. And my own experience, I've been here for 18 months and a little over a year ago, um, my boss then, the J5, left, uh, Major General Sklenka, who's now the deputy commander as a lieutenant general, said to me, why can't you and the Australian FOGO in the J5 take part in the exercises? Probably uh, started by the fact he wanted to get some sleep over the period of the exercise. And he pushed very, very hard, managed to convince the commander at the time, who I believe at that stage was still Admiral Davidson, that the foreign FOGO should be allowed to take part in the exercises. 
which are effectively OPLAN rehearsals. And the sensitivities associated with that took a leader to make a risk decision for that to happen. So I think leadership is the key to this, and that's what we're enjoying in the headquarters at the moment. I'm just going to have a comeback because, sorry, can we go back? I probably didn't answer the second part of that question. Cross COCOMs, I think if I could just leave it before we go on the next question to say, um, our two nations, um, our three nations, you know, US, UK and Australia, have been, as I said at the outset, fighting a war for 20 years uh, in another COCOM. A lot of good lessons out of that, which we just need to bring across into this. And we are, we are. It's really positive. Thanks. Uh, do our militaries have a similar US officer billets on their staffs as we have here at US Indo-Pacific Command? Uh, we are going to that level. Um, you'll be surprised to learn that in Australia we don't have as many echelons of command as you do here. Um, so there really is no real uh, US-specific fleet equivalent. It's probably the fleet command, but we have a joint command which is like probably the equivalent of the COCOM uh, Indo-Pacific Command, and then there's a bit of a gap there. But we are just about, through Indo-PACOM Command um, efforts, to establish an 07 billet in uh, the Australian uh, Joint Operational Headquarters. We have an LNO, uh, but we are seeking to have a, a, a general officer who is embedded. Um, but we have had many US officers embedded, just like we've had many Australian officers embedded um, throughout uh, different uh, combatant commands for a period of time. And, and a lot of my experience, not unlike the others here, has been in the Middle East. Um, and a classic example there is the Combined Maritime Forces, which you know is a truly integrated partnership with uh, Central Command and, and Fifth Fleet there which has a Brit deputy at one star and has had many Australians in there as well. So, yeah, we are working towards that. And it's just the recognition, I think, uh, from both our nations uh, that, you know, when we fight, we fight together. We always have. Look at the history books. Um, you know, the 100 years of mateship, 1917 onwards. Unfortunately, we've been in a lot of wars together um, and I don't think it's going to change. Thank you. Uh, from our perspective in the UK, we only have, we have a single global COCOM uh, and we do have a US LNO staff in there, but not embeds. What we do have though at the operational level um, in the various services is we do have embedded officers. So there's no kind of cookie cutter jigsaw equivalent of me um, in the UK. I mean, that would be horrifying if there was someone like me in the UK. Um, so uh, we, we don't at this level, but this is a unique construct that the US has with its um, combatant commands around the world. Um, and certainly, like I say, in fleet and divisional headquarters, we do have embedded US officers, and that's coming into its own hugely with what's going on in Ukraine. But it also came into its own with the carrier deployment last year, where the embedded um, officers were providing a fantastic service with basically clutching us into Seventh Fleet, etc., as a carrier was um, inbound. How can the government acquisition community, such as PEO uh, C3T, work more closely with partners in the region to enhance information sharing? Uh, can I understand what PEO C3T is, please? Okay. Um, well, how can the government acquisition community... Yeah, well, I, I think from an Australian perspective, well, I have to go, and, and sorry, I have to go from the Australian perspective to answer this because I really haven't had any um, interaction. Yeah, is that we are largely working together already. Um, industry partners in Australia, we're seeing a lot closer relationship between industry partners and the military. I think there's a recognition that that is, has to be more integrated than what it has. And I don't know if you watch Australian politics, but for a long while, probably the last five years, we've been really pushing hard to get that uh, industry, military relationship closer. And then I do know, because I've had close associates that are working in acquisition in Australia that they do a lot of work over here in the US. 
And when you look at Australia's capability, a lot of our capabilities are US orientated. Go figure. I mean, the majority of my Royal Australian Air Force is US Navy platforms. Um, so they're already sharing a lot. I think maybe, and, and I'm just putting this out there, maybe the industry partners need to uh, talk a bit more closely, but, but I'm sure that they are as well because a lot of the industry partners that we have in Australia have parent companies here in the US and the like. So, sorry, that's as best as I probably can do for the person that answer, asked that question. Well, I've actually got the stamp collector version um, of the answer. Um, so, really, uh, from the, the country perspective, so we have security cooperation offices in the majority of the countries in the region. They work alongside uh, the defence attaché. So, it seems to me, I've been a defence attaché. The DAT goes to drink gin and tonic um, in lovely places, and the security cooperation team do the hard yards. I would say that because I'm their boss now. Um, but the linkages are pretty tight in the country. Um, those security cooperation teams have a fingertip feel um, for what's going on in that country and what the requirements are. And if I take the Army example, I've not heard of PEO C3T before, but I have heard of an organization called USASAC, uh, which is the US Army's security cooperation arm that operates alongside USAPAC. So what will happen is the SCO will be discussing a, an information-related system with the country. He'll be pushing that information, he or she will push that information back through USASAC, and then it will go directly into DSCA, the Security Cooperation Agency in DC. Then if you want to see the other side of the loop, um, if you are here next week, we have our Security Cooperation Board for the region, and we're being kindly hosted, I think, uh, Thursday, uh, next week by ELISA and that basically pulls industry in the region and they talk directly to the SCOs. So there's a virtuous feedback loop which is going on all the time and I see that probably on a daily basis coming across my desk. So yes, those, those workarounds, those challenges are identified pretty early and that SCO community know the country inside out and if you want the parallel with Australia, the Australians actually send their acquisition people to do the US course at DSCA in Washington. So they go to the Defence Security Cooperation University, who knew, and they go and do a long course there. They come back and they're speaking American acquisition when they get back to Australia. So this is a pretty, pretty swept up system now. Saved by the Royal Marines again. <laughs> While there is an understandable need to constantly modernise our coalition networking capabilities, how should we reconcile these requirements with partners who, ha who we have a need to share information with, but who may not have the budgets available to keep up with the speed of our modernisation, especially when we can't always share the why? I would say to that we can, um, and if those partners, uh, allies, and I dare say it's more partners of value, valuable to you both now and you can perceive in the future, why wouldn't you help them get to that sharing ability rather than giving them maybe something else? Um, because it gets back to the perspective of, you know, one of the unique strengths about the Alliance and Partners is that even though I speak the Queen's English, probably not as good as the guy next to me, um, and not American English, um, we come from different cultural backgrounds and understandings. So the strength of that is that we bring different perspectives um, and experiences. So we've just lost the question there, but to help with that, if there were those partners and allies that we foresaw as US, we would reap or like to have the benefit of, and they were willing, but there was an affordability issue, why would we not help support that moving forward, is the answer I'd give. Which is a perfect segue into how we do that, is we, instead of using Title X funding, and that's a great thing about security cooperation, we go straight to state and we plug the Title XXII um, authorities under which we can do foreign military financing. So if the country itself isn't able to afford the equipment, uh, we are able 
as part of a longer term programme to prime the pump, if you like, through the FMF system. Many different countries in the region have acquired technology or capability using FMF initially, and then they've gone on to funding those programmes themselves because they've seen the benefit. And of course, if you start in the US FMS system, you've got a contract and a partnership with the US government for the lifetime of the capability in terms of being able to access the supply chain in a very similar way to the, the way that the US military does. And if you buy, as my dad said to me when I bought my first car, if you buy cheap, you'll be buying twice. And that's the kind of mantra that we use in the region. And that's very compelling when the Russians will sell you whatever you like. And the second part of that is why we, we always can't share the why. You're exactly right. But that's probably a benefit of processes like the foreign disclosure process. Use it to its benefit. Run it through there. Take away the why. But my experience being here for the last three months and a lot of the information that's passed to me obviously has to go through the foreign disclosure process is um, it weeds out some of the essentials, but a large part of the output is still quality information. Um, so use those processes that you have established to your benefit. Um, that's what I'd say to the why question. Cyberspace is a domain where our shared adversary in the Indo-Pacific region is deemed to be a true superpower. What can be done to increase allied and partner capabilities to help thwart this, this threat? Share more. Um, understand the capabilities of your partners in cyberspace. You'd be surprised what maybe small countries, nations, allies and partners can do in cyberspace not only from a capability side of the house, but from an authority side of the house. And when we talk about, as we said before, like integrated deterrence, when we look at things such as, to use a military term, fires or the response that we're going to use, I would argue to you that our best approach is probably going to be a coordinated element that brings in those strengths of allies and partners into our own US way forward in terms of addressing the challenge at the time. So I think we just need to share more than what we are and we need to understand capabilities more, the strengths and weaknesses, so we can combine those moving forward. But you're right, cyberspace is a domain that I perceive the only way that we're going to get ahead is through that sharing moving forward. And I'd only add with that that we have come pretty rapidly to the conclusion that when we're doing security cooperation, especially in that area, we really do rely on heavy lifting from Cybercom themselves. So you do sometimes see the non-geographic combatant commands involved in this AO, but I think you're going to see more and more of Cybercom being involved because that is where the expertise lies, to be perfectly honest. That's the people who've got a, got a global look and a global network, and that's probably what we're going to rely on more in the future here in this particular area. And I spoke about it in an offensive language. In defensive cyber as well, we need to share more. What are we seeing that we think the US, sorry, what are we in the US seeing that we think the Australians don't know about? Uh, and that's already happening. I mean, if you look at a classic example that was in, originated in my country was, what do we perceive or assess with Huawei? And we shared that in terms of a defensive element as well. So it's offensive and defensive. I think we have time for one last one before you move into wrap up. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this question that came in, which nation is the best in the world at cricket? <laughs> I, I can say which nation isn't the best in the world at cricket. And that's us, because when you lose to the West Indies, you may as well pack up, go home and um, start again. Admiral. Uh, look, um, our two, I'll play the political card here and say our two nations um, enjoy uh, beating each other up about cricket. It is one of the passions that our two nations share. Um, we learnt how to play cricket um, from the Brits when they obviously uh, established Australia. But I'll just leave it at this. You know, as growing up as a kid, um, in Australia, my father was a very competitive sportsman 
And we can probably all remember the time where you ran faster than your parent or you bowled him out in cricket. It always gave you that great feeling. We always love that feeling when we beat the Poms in cricket, I've got to say. <laughs> but I will say, Rugby World Cup, France, 2023, the reckoning. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, before we move on to the closing comments, um, reflecting on the, the focus of interchangeability, um, I'm, I'm really happy that we don't have to uh, aspire to interchangeability on the cricket field, because uh, I think um, Australia would be in trouble if we had to bring the Brits onto our team. <laughs> um, moving now to the closing comments, uh, Brady Lister. Um, I'd just like to echo my thanks at the very start of this. Uh, conversations like this are really important, and I'd like to thank you all for the questions that you've raised. This is stuff that comes across my desk every day, every week. You know, people are asking the right questions and people are doing the right things. And there are people in the countries, in the region, helping um, allies and partners as much as possible. But never forget that anything, any discussion about risk ultimately is a command responsibility. And we've got commanders who are pushing those responsibilities right to the edge, probably where they're starting to feel uncomfortable. And that's actually starting to have a palpable effect in the region, so thank you. Hey, just to echo some of Alan's points, um, just a couple of final points from me, please. I've had the great privilege of uh, living in your country twice now as a serving officer. I'm a graduate of the National War College in Washington, D.C., um, and now this is my second time living here in the, in the U.S. And I'd just like to say um, thank you because uh, a lot of people will have a lot to say about Americans, but I do find that you are the most gracious people um, in the world. And I've travelled the world. You can see the uniform I wear. You know, I joined the Navy as a young 17-year-old to see the world, and I've achieved that. But you are some of the most gracious and uh, hospitable hosts that I've ever had. And I think... Your relationship with our two nations uh, has been forged over many years that we talked about, but is growing stronger and stronger. And you know when it is an honest relationship because we can call each other out and you're not offended. I think maybe you are. Um, <laughs> definitely the Britties when we talk about cricket. But... Um, we can have an honest conversation, and those honest conversations are what we have to have now. The investment that your country has made in its military force just by having the three of us as embedded officers, not liaison officers, I think is another mark of the maturity that we've come forward. And the last point I would say is that um, you consider the points that we bring. So there was a time there, I think, that it was a nicety in terms of a relationship. You listened to the Australian, you'd, you had a laugh about his funny accent. Um, we said, g'day, mate, um, let's have a Foster's and go down for a couple of shrimps on the barbecue, which we never do, by the way. Um, <laughs> and that was about it. But what I can see now is that you actually listen. You consider what is said and you make changes based upon that information. And that just gets down to trust. Um, so that trust element uh, is key as we move forward um, in unfortunately what will be, I think, a globe that is dominated by some significant challenges uh, as we move forward. So thanks very much. Uh, in closing, I just want to thank everybody for those uh, provoking questions or thought-provoking questions uh, through this morning. Um, and I also want to thank you all for being here today uh, and joining us at the Coalition panel. Um, events like this are extremely important uh, or are, are an extremely important opportunity to improve uh, collaboration between industry, government, academia, and also with your partners uh, such as us. I can't thank ABSIA International and the Hawaii chapter enough uh, for putting this event on, and we cannot really do this without that support. And finally, we absolutely can't be successful in the Pacific without continued focus on how best to optimise our information sharing. These partnerships and seamless interoperability for command and control uh, will be necessary at all levels. Uh, to the panel, uh, Brigadier Lister, Rabel Sunta, thank you for joining the panel today and thank you very much for your insightful comments. Thanks, Kath. Thank you. Thank you.
My name is Ed Riglowitz. I'm the regional vice president for FC International and a local Hawaii chapter member. But I have the honor of, of presenting each of you a, a coin of this 36th annual uh, event that we have. Commander, Rear Admiral, Brigadier. I couldn't think of a better group up here. Can we give them another hand of applause, please? Just a side note, I spent 20 of my 28 years in the service in the Indo-PACOM area. Admiral Mackey was my boss at the time. He's now my boss in AFSIA Hawaii, and, uh, but uh, also involved with the Five Eyes program. And these two countries are probably some of our closest, are the closest uh, allies to us, and uh, they're in, in, in the fight with us all the time. One word that I heard throughout each of their talks was, the word is trust, and I appreciate that, but we could talk about everything else and all of the needs and everything, but trust stood out for me in this, uh, in this talk, and I appreciate those words, and, uh, and we do appreciate each and every one of you, so thank you very much.